All right, Coach Baxter, welcome to the Ohio Cast podcast. Brief introduction. Listen, <clears throat> you've worn a lot of hats, okay? You're a Sandusky Perkins grad, state placer for Coach Travis Crabtree. Um, so you've heard some rough language. I know that. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd, I'd say this to people all the time. Travis is a guy that, like, like I love Crabtree. And, like, somehow, like, you want to run through a wall for him. And, like, he can, like, break you down, but you still want to run through a wall for him. He's, yeah, he's the man. He's good. I mean, he's a Claymont guy. Yes. Listen, the story of his beautiful cousin being married to Drew Outfer is absolutely incredible, by the way. And then, and, and uh, neither of them knew until, like, way into the relationship. Too. Yeah. So, like, he showed up one day and Drew Outfer was there. And what's wild is, He's a high, he was the Heidelberg head coach. Yep. He's a Claymont guy. He wrestled at Heidelberg, was the head coach. And then he makes this move to Sandusky. So there's this automatic hatred for the offers, right? That's just like. Oh, and, and that's like peak St. Mary's is yes. like the enemy. Yeah. Yes, correct. So like prerequisite hatred and you must hate the offers at this point, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I'm guessing you did growing up. Are you and Troy both 2008 grads? Yeah, Troy and I wrestled like 10 times. Really? He thumped me like – it's actually a funny story. We, we can get into it later. Like he okay. beat the heck out of me. Hold on. I got to finish with your intro, Coach Baxter. Yeah. It's Michael okay. Baxter. So then you go from Perkins where you're state placer for Crabtree. You go to Mercyhurst in Erie, Pennsylvania. You wrestle, and then you don't – you're unable to finish your career as an athlete. So you're a student coach because you had shoulder issues, right? Yeah. Bunch of shoulder surgeries. Okay. So and I remember you wore the shoulder harness thing when you went to Perkins. Yeah, probably didn't do much good, but it felt like it helped. How many years did you get in as like a varsity guy or spot starter or whatever you were at? Uh... I, my freshman year, I wrestled at Mercyhurst. Had a really nice year, beat some really high-ranked kids and ended up being one match away from the Nationals. That was a hard one. But uh, then had another surgery my sophomore year, red-shirted. And by the second year I was competing, like, it was like, a, it was towards the end. Like, my shoulder was coming out every match and, like, multiple days of practice. So, I I started, I got, like, one real good year in and another, like, part of a year in. And then at that point, like, they said they weren't going to operate again. So, it was kind of like, all right, I guess I'm done. Okay. So, at that point, you become a student coach, right? Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to tell you this. Most guys, most guys who are done with wrestling are just done with wrestling at that point, right? Yeah, I, I attribute that a lot to Whaler, uh, my coach there. He, like, wouldn't – he's, like – we. I, I remember the conversation we had when I was done competing. Um, I came back from the summer. I'm, like – and, like, I was, like, I got to talk to you. And, and I talked to him. He goes, I know, you're done. And, like, he just kind of knew. Like, he he was my guy. And uh, he's, like, well, you're not done, though. He's, like, you're still going to be around. And, like, he, like, kind of forced me to at first. Like, I didn't want to be around. But, like, he knew I needed a, I needed a little – kicking the butt and guidance and, and stay structured that way. And so I did stick around, you know, that first year was tough because like, you know, you're part of the team, not part of the team. And it was a little bit of a transition, but you know, once you start having fun doing that, it's kind of, you're hooked. So did you do four or five years for undergrad? I did five. I started slowing it down right when I had that second surgery okay. and I was in no rush to catch back up after I mean, college is like fake life. I I, I want I want to tell my nephews this all the time. I'm like, it's not in real life. I mean, like, yeah. you want to take as much time there as you can. Trust me. Yeah, and it actually took six years because then the last year I did a GA year, did an 18th month program, and I got my master's in cardiac rehab. How many master's degrees do you have? Just the one. Just cardiac rehab. Yeah, it was like sports medicine and like my my. Uh, uh, whatever it was, was cardiac rehab we did. Gotcha. Okay. So from that point, we're, we're still in the intro about you. Basically. I know. I'm sorry, man. So then we go and you, well, it, we've moved beyond intro. Um, we, We're just talking about your, your career path at this point. Mm -hmm. From there, when do you get the head coaching job at Coker, a brand new D2 school in, hold on, North Carolina? South Carolina. South Carolina. Coker. So it wasn't brand new. It, it, it had gone for a couple years. And um, their coach ended up, he was a Newberry grad. The Newberry job opened up and he jumped right into that. He was Got the right hire for that. Um, so Is he still I, at Newberry? 
Huh? He's not. He just stepped away. Great dude. Big guy, guy, right? He's a big guy. Awesome yeah, guy. Yeah, good guy. He married a, yeah, yeah, he's a great dude. Um, But anyway, so I'm like 25 and this opens up and, you know, Whaler was really good at facilitating like, hey, what do you want to do next? How do you want to build? How do you want to grow from here? And I threw my name in. I threw my name in a couple places. They flew me down there. I interviewed and I mean, at 25, I was pretty shocked. Like I, I got the job and it was, it was a really good learning experience. Um, it hardened me up a little bit in terms of like the world and, uh, and how that works in, in like a, in an adult environment. But, uh, it was a great experience. Kids were awesome. People were awesome. St- stayed there for two years and then went back to Mercyhurst and was Whaler's assistant coach for three more years. Okay. So here's the question. Here's the, you are donating a lot of time as an NCA Division II coach, whether it's the head coach, assistant coaches, whatever you are. You guys are putting in seventy hours a week, and dude, I, listen, I've heard some of the salaries of some of these guys. It's it's insulting. It's literally insulting what they're paying some of the guys. Yeah. Some of these guys are making thirty five, forty, fifty grand. Head coaches, yeah, NCA Division II, and we're talking seventy hours a week. 51.5 weeks a year, right? And they take a little bit of time off, maybe, right? Because you want to remain married or in a relationship. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It's, yeah. It's, it's wild what they do to the D2 coaches. We're, we're <laughs> going to circle around back to that. And then, okay, so now you are with OAC Ohio Athletic Committee in the state of Ohio, which is the middle school, um, I guess, governing body, essentially, of some core sports, football, wrestling, cheerleading right yeah yeah so moved back two years ago this is my second season with the oac okay. and so i took that job in may of 2021 okay Wait, no 22 yeah 22 so you, this will be going on your second year in may yeah a year and a half okay so jared opera you work directly with jared opera he would be your direct boss right yes absolutely yeah okay you are also an assistant coach at Sandusky St. Mary's Central Catholic, correct? Yes. Is that weird? That's got to be weird. Um, It was at first. And, like, I actually, like, it's funny because, you know, you got a little crap. At the, I got a little crap at the beginning from some people in the area. Because when I was going through, St. Mary's was still, like, like any, like any other program that has success. Like, I think St. Mary's won state in 94. And I think they were the underdog. And, like, they were, you know, cheering for them. And then they had a, a, a five or six year run in the early 2000s. And I think when it started, they were still the good guys. By the time I was coming through, it was one of those things where like someone needs to beat St. Mary's and, you know, some vicious rivalries came from that. And Perkins and St. Mary's had some really ugly rivalries too. And like, you know, you have dynamic personalities. I think, you know, two of these people off the bat, you have Crabtree and then you have like a Corey Upfer and a Tanner Shear who are, who are guys that, you know, I don't think would all of those I mentioned are guys that probably wouldn't back down from an argument. So it, it brought a lot of contention. And I mean, I'm telling you, those are some of the funnest duels I ever, SBC duels was wild. And like the, I'm sure when you were going through all the way through when I was going through. Melee. Um, oh yeah. And it, it was, it was, it was a ton days, of fun. Too. It was two days. It was four and three then. Mm-hmm. You wrestled I mean, three, all three, eight four, three, is, four. Yeah. You, you could, I mean, uh, there were times where you you know, state, you know, yeah. Oak Harbor had it a lot. Remember like Danny Witt, I mean, uh, Danny Michaels and Keith Witt state finals match in the SBCs. And like you had it in times in the nineties where there were kids that were state finalists that were taking third or fourth in the conference. Yeah. It, it's wild. I mean, my brother Tate's a state champion in Ohio and never won the SBC. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, yeah. How about one of the worst decisions by a school district ever recorded is O'Carver leaving the SBC? Yeah, man, that's a shame. Um, like, what I, are they? What are they doing? And I, I said something last year at the to George at the at SBCs, and like you could tell he was bummed out. Like George is yeah, such a sad. huh? He makes him sad, but it's not his call. No, it's not. No, but I, what I'm saying is like you know George is a huge piece of SBC wrestling. You yeah. can't write the story of SBC wrestling without talking about George Bergman. And right. like it's a shame that like he can't finish his career in there. Um, yeah, I'm not happy just, about it. But ultimately, 
You know who the ball, you know who the superintendent of a Carver Schools is, right? Who is it? It's Kathy Bergman, his wife. Oh no. She I hold didn't... on. To be fair, she didn't take over as the superintendent until this was already an ink done deal. Yeah. So I I, I gotta defend the Bergmans in that one instance. I, I, yeah. I'll pile on a bunch of other times, but she wasn't the boss yet. Because I don't I don't I'll be honest with you, I don't think it would have happened. No, I, 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 think, I, I think I can't someone, speculate. Someone that had some passion in the area wouldn't have let that happen. Like I, just, in, in, yeah, in I, mean, I mean, it's funny too because Paul actually re- was the first recruiting call I got for Mercyhurst Bergman. Paul, Paul's the man. Yeah, he's a Paul he's a, People's <laughs> Champ. <laughs> Paul Paul Bergman's a good dude. Um, I remember those guys ever since they were little. I've been on a on a uh, so in this whole thing. Bob Bergman is the head coach at Genoa. Genoa, yeah. And man, I've been laying on pretty thick about um, how Carver's going to come over and win the conference. Even though I don't think they can beat Genoa because Genoa's got a pretty good team. And this would be like when I bring up the St. Mary's thing to you, it would be like me being going to Genoa and wearing burgundy and oh yeah that's that you know what I mean like it's pretty intense <laughs> right rivalry. next to each other. That's a real rivalry. My mom and dad, um. Their house is about four miles from Genoa High School and about 12 or 13 from Oak Harbor. So you're in the Oak Harbor district, but yeah, or we're the first point west. Mm-hmm. It's That's great. Awesome. It's a massive school district. It's it's three townships, so it's pretty big. Mm-hmm. Um, but okay, so you're with OAC now, you're running the OAC tournaments. So which brings me to we got a big OAC grade school state championships this weekend. Mm-hmm. Three divisions are contested, right? Yep. Can you so, give me can you give me a quick preview of dress it down three two one for me division three on down? What can you tell me? Um. So we we didn't do. It's not the divisions like the high school is because there's different teams that are in it. Okay, I noticed that. I noticed. I'm looking at. I'm like, how's Kenston Division Three? I was looking. That was what yeah. I was and at. so it, it just depends on the teams that are that are getting into it. Um, I mean, every everyone's gonna be pretty competitive. I'll, like, I'll, I'll I'll run it down right now. Division One has Hilliard Davidson, which I mean, they got a ton of kids. They're that Ohio. The the club is Ohio Heroes, and they're everywhere. Like they have like a ton. They're almost like Pursuit, where there's just tons of kids in them. They're always winning point series stuff. So Hilliard Davidson. Brexville, uh, Columbus DeSales, Eds, Perrysburg, and Wadsworth. I mean, in that list right there in Division One, those are like some of the heavy hitters in Ohio. And then, so that's Division One. Division Two goes Bishop Watterson, Louisville, St. Paris, Graham, Barberton, Highland, and then Oregon Clay. Like another, like, I bet you anybody that knows Ohio wrestling can name 10 kids from any of those schools in the past 10 years. Uh, so I mean that one's competitive. Then Division Three has some some guys as well as the Delta, Akron St. Vincent St. Mary's, Archibald, Columbia Station, Kenston, and Crestwood. So I mean I think every division that there is has some really highly contested guys at the top. Um, so I mean it's gonna be fun because they're they're all gonna wrestle each other and it's a pool style. Um, you know whoever does the best overall is gonna win, and I can honestly see someone winning that takes a loss during the weekend. Okay. Like so you might have to come question. down to criteria. Is there an ultimate champ? Um, Not this year. Um, Last year we crossed over because of the amount of, like they were only getting four matches and get a fifth match with the crossover, but we're not going to have a crossover this year. So it's year to division one champ, your division two champ. If we had, I mean, asking kids to wrestle six matches in a day, six duels in a day can, can be a lot. We think five is like the right number for these kids. So we, we're not going to do another round. Okay. So here's my question. Well, can the championship be wrestled in the first match or did you guys go and actually look at it and be like, we need to put, you know, St. Yes. Edward versus Braxville in the final or St. Edward versus Perrysburg or whoever <clears throat> did, you, so did you, were you conscious about that? We seeded it. And so we seeded it based on of OAC state placement. So like, get five points for placing at state you get um three for placing at the divisional state and you get two for placing at the oac district and so it is it is what it is like that makes that takes subjectivity out of it for us 
but that doesn't mean it's going to be right. And there's a couple first round matchups that I've, that, that I've already seen because the brackets are ready. Um, there's a couple first round matchups where I'm like, oh, that might be the winner. That one might win this whole thing. Which, okay. So know, here's my I, question. I are, you, towards the end, but... are you going to hook me up? Cause I'm going to be at my kid's basketball game to start. Are you going to mm-hmm. get those two best first round matchups for me? Yeah, we're getting uh, Jared, Jared's uh, taking a book out of Zeb Miller. We, he bought a couple extra phones. Going to set them up for you. Listen, I, I won't be able to commentate nearly as well as you do. No, no, no you don't need to commentate. We just need to have the, you got to have a stack. You got to have yeah. a stack of phones. Always, I'm always stacked up with phones. I'm always, uh, I'm trying to. Bring as many as I can because I, given your turn your phones in is stupid when you do what I do. Yeah, you can keep them and use them as a tool. You know, I yeah, oh yeah, you just keep them in in, in video because like the the video lasts forever. Yeah, I mean, listen, man, pe- people who turn their phones in, if you've got the disposable income to keep them, don't do that because mm-hmm. it could, you could you could start a business filming whatever you want. Make so, it make it almost like a you know like a heck of a side gig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, give me your matchups of the weekend. Who do you see hitting in those pools that you like? Who do you who do you like? Um, matchups, you know, whether it's St. Edward, Brexville, whoever it is, tell me the good ones that are going to hit. I mean, I, I always think any of those blue chip Division One programs running into each other are interesting. And what I consider the blue chip ones are essentially most of the ones in Division One. But I always am particularly fond of seeing a, a Brexville, St. Ed's, Perrysburg kind of going at it. Um, those are always fun. And, and those kids, I mean, these kids are so good. They're better than they've ever been. Yeah. And watching this high level of wrestling for these grade school kids is out of control. Uh, in the Division Two, I think one that's really common in the Division Two high school as well is Bishop Watterson. And then, uh, and then also St. Paris Graham has just been, you know, second to essentially Ed's in Ohio for the past 20 years. And they've been better than them sometimes. Yeah, they've been, yeah, there's been five, five, seven times where they've been at better than Ed's in the last 20 years. So yeah, but I, you know, those are the give them the credit times. where credit's due, right? I know you know that. Um, yeah, those are the so, flagship programs, you know. And that D3 one, Delta, Delta, Archbold. St. Vincent, St. Mary's, Columbia Station, okay, Kenston and Crestwood. Okay, so those, there should be some good ones there too. But our yeah. Delta, you know, they're neighbors, right? Yeah, no, that one's tough. And then <clears throat> Akron, St. Vincent, St. Mary's is a lot of the neighborhood kids. And, man, they're okay. doing a really good thing. Uh, the, the neighborhood club is doing really well. I There's a couple of kids that wrestled on Team Ohio with me and Bernie last weekend. And, and those guys are, I mean, those kids are North Akron, right, man? They're tough. They hand they're pretty. hard. Oh, yeah. You know, that, yeah. So they're one to watch out for, too. Awesome. I love it. Um, That's a good one. And then you guys leave the mats down, right? Are, mm-hmm. are we going to be in two gyms, by the way? Are we going to be in the little aux gym too? Yeah, but we're going to keep them split. So there's going to be three mats that Division One stays on, three mats that Division Two stays on, and three mats that Division Three stays on. Okay. Um, don't ask me which ones yet. Yeah, that's a, that's a J.O. question. But uh, Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll cross yeah. that bridge when we get to it, okay? Yeah. Uh, so the mats stay down, and then the following day you have defense sub duels, which you guys are running both events, right? Yeah, we um we we chatted with so we last year defense used our equipment and our gear, and we kind of helped in like a a little bit of a role with defense sub duels. And then we talked with uh, Charlie and Guy and, and a couple other people that run the defense sub duels, and, and you know we're like, hey, like we'd love to help more at the behind the scenes stuff and organizing this because i mean that's what jared does jared is so detail oriented that i think he can make anything more efficient um so i i think so they were like yeah absolutely i think i think guy wanted some things the way he does and then the rest he's like you guys deal with and he was great to work with and i have a good time with charlie charlie's charlie's, charlie's my guy charlie's my guy yeah they don't but make a better charlie Agazino, dude I know he's the, he's the man. So uh, they've been really helpful with us, and the thing, but, uh, I know, whatever you I need, know, man, the they got that, it. And uh, they've been really good. Um, they've been a really good ambassadors for wrestling, especially yeah. with us. And so I think the way that they want to run it is with the way we want to run it. Keep it a little bit smaller, a little more exclusive, 
trying to have a nice mix between out-of-state teams and Ohio teams. There's some cool ones coming. Uh, Askren's bringing two teams. Askren's coming back, huh? Yeah. Then there's a contender from uh, Indiana's coming. Quest with uh, Jim Akerley's coming. Quest out of PA. And then normally we've had Father Ryan in the past from Tennessee, but I don't know if they're going to make it up. They're not coming. Spatola, um, nice. that club's coming. And then like one of my one of my uh, favorites to my heart is uh, All Americans coming with Coach Waller. Um, Coach Waller's going to be there coaching his heart out. Yeah, my uh, one of my teammates who was who ended up being my assistant coach when I was at Coker. His name's Angelo Bortoluzzi. He's the man, but he's like a Waller guy through and through. He like traveled around for his summer camps, like when they were going to Michigan and stuff. So I've heard some awesome Waller stories. I was actually at a wedding with Waller this summer and had a good time chopping it up with him. I love old man Waller. He's yeah, he's the man. He's the man. Uh so you go from a community, it goes essentially, um it goes from like a community statewide duels to a national level event, right? Yeah. What changes about weight classes and ages? Now we go from grade school, which would be K through six, essentially. Now you go from K to eight. Is that essentially right? Yeah. So there's a couple more weight classes. It looks more like a uh, like a national middle school duels or like the tyrant stuff. There's some more weight classes. So I think there's 18 weight classes for. Um, I don't don't quote me on that, but uh, I think there's 18 weight classes for defense soap duels, and it goes K through eight. So yeah, um, it'll it'll be a lot of fun. It's really cool because there's a lot of kids that wrestle on Team Ohio that the OAC kind of helps out with, and I I help Coach Bernie with. There's a ton of those kids on defense, and like I'll tell you what, these kids, I I, I keep saying this, but they're better than they've ever been. It's just. It's, it's unbelievable. So many kids the clubs have made this like it's evolved into this just gigantic monster. I mean, they're better than I was in college. Like skill Crazy. for skill. Yeah. Like it's we're not making that up. No, it, it, it's they're way better. I'm not, I'm not like an college, old person that. that's like back in my day, they used to do this. No, they're better. They're and way like, better. Uh, what would you say the biggest thing about running these tournaments? You know, because this is your second year through OAC, right? What's your thing that, you know, that's the most challenging about it? And what do you think is the biggest thing kids and parents and coaches get out of it? What's what's challenging and what do kids really get out of OEC stuff? In terms of my job or in terms your, of your the- job and what the kids experience? Yeah. So in terms of my job, I think the, the hardest part is trying to make everybody happy and that you're not going to do that. So you're going to have to. So keeping a hard line, I think Jared and Jude have done a great job of like OAC events. There's a standard like weigh-ins there's times they make the weight or they don't make the weight there's rules and it's either it's black and white and I think that gives credibility to the organization but sometimes I can be a little soft and feel bad about it you know because you feel bad when a kid misses weight or a kid doesn't make weigh-ins but I also think that keeps the integrity of the organization um the in terms of the parents and like the, the the athlete participation like I don't know. I think one of one of the biggest things I want to happen is my whole goal with the OAC. I think our goal is to make sure these kids wrestle in high school. So the amount of pressure we put on them, the amount of wins and losses that matter, we're just trying to get better. We want these kids just to get better, get experience, get learning experience and grow as wrestlers. Cause like, I mean, I like, just like you, this sport changed my life. You know, I think it can teach you incredible lessons about life. And it can do wonderful things to you. And I want these kids to gain the same things that we did. Um, and so a lot of the pressure I don't like. So, like, just go out, compete your hardest, learn from your mistakes, and move on. Like, not on my soapbox for a second, I guess. Well, yeah, winning is – there's just so much emphasis placed on winning at, at youth sports. I, I keep trying to I've, – I've told this to a couple dads and tried not to be too harsh about it. But, like – when you win, you know, an OAC state title at eight years old, that you should be proud of that. But all that means is your kid's a good eight-year-old. You know, like the kid should be proud, but all that means is he's a good eight-year-old. That doesn't mean he's going to be a good 15-year-old. Like there's a lot of steps that have to go in terms of, you know, growth and development, commitment and passion. And I always, I don't think the kids are ever the biggest problem. I think the expectations of, of coaches and parents can be the problem. 
So, you know, defensive duels, I guess that's, we're going to learn, right? It's a learning experience. It's a new thing. We don't know what's going to happen there. So it's like, I guess you can't really report to me on what you're, what you're expecting from defensive duels, right? Yeah. I, I, I we just want it to run smooth. We want to gain some data points for this year. Um, I do think that we might want to grow it a little bit in the future. And I think guys a little, I think guy and Charlie are receptive to that a little bit, but we don't want to grow for the sake of growing. I think we want to run an, you know, a quality kick-ass event that people come in, have a great time. They really enjoy how we do things and and the the systematic approach and enjoy that part of it. And if we do that and we can grow it organically and open up opportunities for other people, then we're doing our job. But if we're growing just for the sake of growth and we're like, all right, we're going to get 70 teams next year. And then it's a, it's chaos in a cluster. Then we're not doing our job. We, you know, we want to run a premier event. Yeah, it's just like Dom D'Amelio is like really hesitant about growing national middle school duels past mm-hmm. 32 because it opens up this whole new like just can of worms, man. It's mm-hmm. like now you're, you know, you're doubling the teams. You got to move to a new, new facility. You're bringing people in coast to coast, north to south, border to border, Canada to Mexico. You know what I mean? Like. You're going Atlantic to Pacific. Like you're dude, it's a massive event already. And it's like Dom D'Amelio and you know, his team is real hesitant about going past. And and I and they do a great job. And I think 32 to me from the outside looking in feels like a real quality number. You know, and I, I think there's plus or minus a couple that you could get to. But you know, we've been in like Tyrant does a good job, but like at, we went to Columbus Day Duels and there's like 72 mats. It was oh. wild. What? Um, yeah, so it, but they said, and I don't know if it's true or not. They said this is like the largest tournament. They think that they they from their research that had ever been held in terms of a middle school dual meet tournament. There's like 72 mats. It was I mean, they did a great job, but for me, the level of stress that I'd be dealing with, like I would I would need weeks to like recover from that. No, no thanks. Yeah. I don't want their life in that situation. Not no. at all. Nope. Yeah. Hashtag nope. No, and and I, the other big part of that is, I mean, the hardest part we're having with running events like that is officials. And like you know, we're 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 probably not at the down spot of officials because you know our, our officials are aging out. They are. It, why would you be an official right now? Is a question a lot of people are asking. So that's actually another thing that defense has done with us is we kind of started this initiative where we're trying to mentor twenty. 24 new officials for this year and we're going to try and repeat that hoping that if we can retain half of those every year we start digging ourselves out of the lack of officials hole that we put ourselves in defense has been wonderful with us and the oac to like donate some money for mentors to bring in young kids and and uh have these mentees learn with someone on their someone next to them that can you know catch them when they fall so we're really pushing hard to, you know, reach out to colleges and younger kids that want to become officials because that is one of the biggest uh, hurdles that we're going to have to overcome in the next five or 10 years. So, you know, we talk about elementary, grade school, state, and junior high wrestling, right? But And, you know, we talk a little high school, but I think the big thing that, you know, when I talk to a guy like you, would like to pick your brain is, you know, you're a D2 coach for basically a decade, right? Yeah. And um, – you were a D2 head coach. You were a D2 assistant <laughs> coach. Um, you know, you've done it in different states, Pennsylvania and South Carolina. What do you think parents need to do now, whether it's youth that we're looking at now, high school? What do people need to do? What do they need to really focus on when it comes to sending their kid to the next level, whether it be NCAA, DB, Division One, Two, Three, NAIA, JUCO, right? We all we all know Baxter. We already all know everybody's D one. We already know that, right? Yeah. We know every kid's D one, right? Full ride D one guy, right? I think I think something that I looked at a ton, and this is very unpopular, even with even with some of the people in our area, is I think you you make sure your kids a well rounded person, like in terms of athletics. Like wait wait what you said that's a, what I you said it was unpopular. Somebody has a problem with what you just said. There's that's not what. Well, not the. I'll get to the problem part. The well-rounded. I was gonna immediately go with the well-rounded athletes, 
because I personally like look at like look at you like you you played multiple sports. I yes. love seeing kids because I know they haven't been maxed out yet, right? They haven't been training year round and they're not maxed out. So I really think, and then I think those kids are generally better athletes too, the ones that do other things and move differently. And then the well rounded part of it is, you know, I like we were really focused on like, did this kid have a three point a three point five? Like, those are those are fairly attainable for most people. Like we, we want these kids that have, you know, that aren't robots in wrestling that are a little bit more well-rounded and, and they'll be able to survive that first year. Cause I mean, we both can think of plenty of examples of kids that had such a controlled sheltered wrestling life for years. And then they go off on their own and they don't know who they are. Like no. we want these kids, we want, you know, I'm always looking for kids as a, as a coach that, you know, they, they've gone through a little bit of life and they know, who they are and they're going to be mature enough to handle that transition. Um, I think that's wild. A big point. that okay. So being a well-rounded person is like ultimately what you should be going to school for. It should yeah. be what athletics are for. It mm -hmm. should be what your social life's about. You should be able to be exposed to a bunch of different things and decide what is for you and what your what your passion is going to be. What what you're going to care about the most, like. I, it's it's insane to me. Like I, when people say to me, you know, like, I'm going to be at my kid's basketball game, right? I'm going to show up to grade school a little past noon, right? Um, a lot of people, I, I can't believe you let your kid play basketball. I do. A lot, a lot of people say that to me. Yeah. I'm like I dude, they got plenty of time. And, and, and not even that. I think, uh, I'm, I just keep talking about Whaler, but, uh, Whaler said something to me a couple of years ago. I, I, that stuck with me a lot. It's like, his kids don't wrestle and like, would he like them to? Yeah. But I, he talked about this. Like if your kid finds a fire for something, your only job as a parent is to put fuel on that fire. If they got a passion, you fuel it, you know, whatever that passion may be, you fuel it and, and you, you let them know that you want them to be the best they can at that. And so if your kid plays basketball and has a passion to play basketball, then you better bust your butt and like try and get better and, and grow in that in whatever thing you choose to do I, I think that's more important than choosing the path for your kid yeah do you think i wanted to play i want to just just, just be honest here do you think i want to play i wanted to play 10 games of pig tonight no probably not but but you're also you like pig. you're spending time screwing around with your kid that's great Correct. right like, I, I, don't about pig. Do. I don't yeah. care about pig i don't care about basketball yeah I care about my kid though I you care win? about him, loving it. Huh? Did you win? I smash him. And then it gets crazy because he's super competitive. And then <laughs> like, wait, you're telling me a Miller's competitive. Get out of here. He's super competitive. I'm like, whatever. But then when he starts acting crazy, I start trash talking him. Yeah. And then 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 you just watch him melt. It's just yeah, it up, then he melts down, and then I gotta go take a walk out in the woods and <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I didn't want to play 10 games of pig today, but I did, you know what I mean? Like I, I don't love basketball or like it even, but um, I love my kids. So it's like, if that's a way to spend time with my kid, I want to do it, you know, but mm -hmm. I'll be at the thing, but you know, Tommy, Tommy, the six-year-old, he'll be playing. <laughs> He's big and gigantic and just learning the game and scores like a bunch of points and has really gotten better throughout the season. And, I know the measure shouldn't be as he's scoring points is being a good team. It's, po it's positive ball. reinforcement when you're doing yeah. well, you yeah. know, like, yeah. Uh, but I think that, you know, being well-rounded is, is what everything should be. Why you're doing it. Why, 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 what be in the band, be in the choir. Right. Yeah. I was yeah, in the choir. I got a nephew who was in the band. Right. And, yeah. And, and all that, that transitions into like the college experience and the kids you're going after is yeah. is really important. I think it's going to get even more important with the way that the field is in college now, because oh. it's it's literally just blue chips. And then you know, look at I mean, Division two and most Division one schools are going to be analogous pretty soon because you know you're having Northern Illinois gets their first All American in how long, and South in uh, North Dakota State gets these All Americans, and boom, they're gone. I'm not blaming the kids. I'm not blaming the coaches, but Normally you get you have a year like that and you build from it. Correct. But now it's like we have a good year and they're gone. Now it's and start so, over time. It's rebuild yeah. time. And and I think that the, the that 
we're getting really close to a point where lower end division one schools are almost the same as division two schools. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, Cannon just beat KSU, right? Yeah. And um, the week before, uh, Lake Erie dominated Mercyhurst and Gannon, right? Well, the yeah. Gannon duel was closer, but yeah, Lake Erie's got a really good team, man. Like they're tough, man. And yeah. I don't know Boomer, uh, Coach Fetchko, but yeah, he's done a very good job there. And really I think, good team, really yeah. good. Team. But like the D two thing's crazy to me because, as I stated earlier, you know, hey, everybody's a D one guy. We know that, right? You mm-hmm. you know that, ah, Coach. I'm a D one guy. How many mm-hmm. times did you, uh, tell me, over or under? Give me the over or under, over or under. You're on the phone recruiting over a hundred, under a hundred. Got it. Oh yeah. Over coach. I'm a D one guy. How many times did you hear it? Over a hundred over. Yeah. Over and 200. It's gotta be close. Cause here's, here's the thing too. If we're recruiting, the, if we're recruiting the right kids in division two, we want to be competing with max schools and the Edinburgh's and the lock havens. Like those are the teams that like, we want to be in recruiting battles with them because then we in Bloomsburg. After, yeah, we know we're going after like the right guys. But if we're going and, and if we're going after someone that no one else is competing for, then sometimes we're like, are we finding a kid that's a diamond in the rough? Or are we going after a kid that we might think is good and we might be wrong about? So a lot of times we were going after kids that were Cleveland State kids or OU kids or, you know, any Buffalo. Of them, the Max Buffalo yeah. was probably a lot of them too. Tons of proximity, them. Proximity, right? And there's kids. What I will say is if you in your heart of hearts are know what the route may look like and you're willing to embrace it, if you're like, I'm going to sit the bench for a while, I'm going to grind, I'm going to learn, I'm going to get in the lineup, and then I'm going to see if I can make a run. Like if you know that's what you want to do, go do it like more power to you. If you want to get in the lineup right away and compete for national titles and all Americans and things like that, then I think a division two route for a lot of these kids is probably the way to go. And I think it's, it's being, uh, it's being self-aware of what you really want, because I think a lot of people in the back of your head are saying, Oh, you're D one, you're D one. And you may be, but like, what do you want? Yeah. Well, it's wild to me because self-awareness is written on the board in my classroom and I point to it constantly to kids. And I'm like, understand, you know, if you, if you're afraid of heights, you don't want to be an iron worker. If you hate kids, you don't want to be a teacher, you know, little, little tidbits like that. You don't like rules. Don't be a police officer. Right. Like pretty simple things. Right. Yeah. It's like what you just said (laughs) in perspective. Like if you think as a one-time state placer in Ohio, you're going to go on to a team you're going to go to Northern Illinois. You're going to go to Central Michigan, Ohio U. You're going to get in the starting lineup, and you're going to make a run for an NCAA tournament, then get to the NCAA tournament and make the round of 12 and win a match in the round of 12 and get on the podium. You're you're, you're, you're not you're, self-aware. You're lying. You're, not, you're, not you're self-aware. lying to yourself. You're lying. Like one, kid, one kid I think of a ton and is Dylan D'Amelio. And like he was a killer in high school, and it took him a while to get in the lineup. He's a four-time state champ, though. He's a blue chipper. I know, but it took him a while to get in the lineup. A kid that good, he was in and out of the lineup for a couple years, then made the run to the round of twelve, and now he's on top of the world. But there's kids like you're saying that aren't Dylan D'Amelio in high school that are one-time placers that think that they're gonna jump right into the lineup. And that kid had to grind. And I'm telling you, I've, I've been impressed. Yeah, he's he's made for watch. that. Dylan D'Amelio is made for that. He is. If you were to ask the Ohio State coach, who's the biggest grinder? Who's the toughest guy? That's Yeah. I'm telling you, there's most likely a pretty good chance I can't speak for those coaches. They're probably going to be pointing to that guy. Absolutely. Dylan and D'Amelio like, is. What, yeah. What I yeah. meant by that is it was even tough for him to All right. at the beginning. Correct. You know, and you're, you're not wrong. That good. Good, and he hurt his knee. Mm-hmm. He had a couple different ligament tears. He's been battling knee injuries, and he's just so tough and gritty, and just keeps going and going and going and going. And his knee'll be all taped up. He'll win in overtime or losing overtime. And you know what though, dude's still making weight. Yeah, you know finding what? a way. That guy is going to be really successful in life. 
I mean, whether you know, it's his social life, whether it's his relationships, whether he has a significant other, whatever it is, if it's if he runs a business, if he works at a school, if he's a coach, if he is a friend, if he's a boss, a mentor, an under whatever, that guy's going to be very successful at it. He does everything right. I had a really, I had a really cool interaction with him when he was a freshman. This is when you knew that he was, a like he was a guy. Um, they went to the Ohio Intercollegiate Open, and I was running a scale, and like I don't know, th- there was an issue that happened, and like Coach Ryan called him. There were sophomores and juniors and seniors, and it was like Dylan had the weigh-in sheet, and he was the one that like, you know, like he so clearly that kid was special from the beginning. It's yeah, I mean, and I I deal with them so much, and they're Genoa people, we're Oak Harbor people. So it's like, I knew as a kid, I knew he was special as a kid, right? And I remember like, uh, how'd we get here? Oh, we we're talking about grinding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, but yeah. everybody thinks they're everybody thinks they're the D one guy. They think they're Walk the one Demelio. Yeah. And even and Dylan Demelio wasn't Dylan Demelio for two two or three years. He had to toil. He had yeah. To toil. yeah. And hey. and if that's the, if you're not if that's not what you're, if you look at that path and you're like, I want to jump in right away, then maybe that division one lifestyle isn't for you. But if you're willing to go and grind, then you should go try and accomplish your goal. Yeah. Here's what's wild about him in Detroit. He lost a match to Quinn Kenner who transferred to Ryder, who was his teammate. Yeah. That's crazy. So I want you to think about that. If you're Dylan D'Amelio, and you're like, wait a minute, I'm the Ohio State guy. This guy left and went to a max school. He's beating me at the NCAs. That had to be like, eh, yeah, that's like a mind melt there, right? Oh. Then he's coming back the next year, beating Cole Matthews in the round of 12. Cole Matthews pretty good, right? I mean, he's just, that bad. Yeah, I mean, you just got to think about these things. Like the Dylan D'Amelio thing, to your point, though, is Dylan D'Amelio, D'Amelio wasn't Dylan D'Amelio or the expectations of Dylan D'Amelio in most people's eyes and probably in his own mind for the ter- first two years at Ohio state. Yeah. He had to grind. And so like that, but like that takes a unique level of like discipline and grit and toughness to like power your way through that. And if you yeah. want to see if you're made of that metal, then go do it. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you right now, the percentage of success there is going to be under 0.1%. Yeah. When you're a one-time state blazer, state qualifier, I mean, you got these dudes who are freaks like Keith Gavin and Phil Davis didn't win state titles in high school in PA, and they won NCAA titles. Okay. Yeah. Brian Dolph never won a state title in Ohio, won the NCAAs, right? Like Unique cases, yeah. These are such unique cases. You know, but Dylan D'Amelio was a blue blood, a top 10 recruit, and – it, look what it took him. You know what I mean? He's he's an all one time All American, but dude's a freak. And I, listen, <laughs> we got I got a guy like my nephew Wyatt, right? Mm-hmm. Undefeated state champ goes to App State. You know, has some injuries, some illnesses, and and it, and it's just dude, it's hard to power power through it. Figures out, hey, maybe I'm a D two guy. T- takes yeah. a transfer, better situation now. Now he's a top ten ranked guy in the you know in NCAs and D two and. He's in Grand Valley, right? Yeah, he's getting a better experience out of it, right? He's getting and I think that's another thing about the division two life is I think for the most part, there is there is a little bit of an off season. Like correct. You know, do, like definitely like go home and do an internship or work in the summer, make a little money, or you know, that there's a little bit more like we used to go home for Thanksgiving most years. You know, go home, see your family for two days. And you know, if, if that stuff that's important to you, then like it gives you a little more freedom and you can get a little bit of the college experience that I think I wanted to have. I don't mean I was nowhere near a D one kid, but I, I enjoyed that part of it is the holistic ability to learn. Right. I'm going to tell you this. Dylan D'Amelio ain't taking any days off. No, I took days that off. That guy ain't <laughs> taking any days off. Right now. Yeah. Hold on. You got a Carson Karshala. And you have a Dylan D'Amelio. We're talking two vastly different talent levels, right? Mm-hmm. The ability levels are very different. And I know yeah. you're talking to somebody. Ah, talent's not a thing. I yeah, will put these two guys next to each other, 
and have them do certain skills. And you tell me there's not such thing as talent, right? Like mm-hmm. Harshala actually has to do less because his body will break down if he trains like a maniac, right? Mm-hmm. And then Dylan D'Amelio has to grind through things and be superhuman and take care of his body better. But he, you know, a guy like that, like it's like kryptonite for a guy like that time off, right? Like, and then I think he's like, man, I, I think that guy's probably like, I know I do more than all these guys. That's probably a third period mentality of Dylan D'Amelio. Oh, yeah. like, like I know I can win because I work all these guys. Yeah. That's a part of his confidence. And that's a part of like kind of how the old man raised him, you know, Dom, you know, raised him that way. It's like, we're going to do more than everybody. You know, I'd see him at Burnett's all the time when he didn't need to be at Burnett's and was, you know, just coming from a Team USA camp or wherever he was, always getting extra work. And the guy, the guy just gets it. And I think though that's actually an interesting point too, because I think there's a lot of dads that see what some of these other dads were able to put their kids through. But it takes a unique kid to be able to like thrive in that situation. Yeah. Not everybody can go to their practice, a practice afterwards, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Like not every kid is built for that. Like some kids need a little time off. Some kids need a break here or there. But like the unique kids, you power them through it. But everyone's like, oh, I saw this person do it. Yeah. So my kid should be able to do that as opposed to reading what their kid can do. Yeah. And here's the other thing. Can everybody do with the Chirellas and Carson Karshala, what those guys did, and start wrestling competitively in ninth grade? No. Can everybody do that? Can everybody, ah, you know, I'm around the sport. I train. I'm at some practices. I get it. My dad was elite. And then just jump in there and be elite by 10th, 11th, 12th grade. No, that's not a, that's not a common path. That's no. an exception. We all get that. They're the 0.1% of skill, ability, and toughness. Correct. And those guys, yeah. I mean, if you look at how they're raised, they're not raised like most people either, right? Like they're not raised like most people. Chirellas are, you know, they're, they're, they're very business minded oriented right the, dad, the old man owns a bunch of businesses and then you Jeff got Steve was a dog trainer right with the whistle yeah right? yeah yeah you got all these super unique things about these people obviously um moran defected from uh the caucasus mountains and abkhazia where he grew up wrestling chechnians yeah uh, dagestanis Ossetians. Uh, Georgians, all these different people, and, and he was raised to the old Soviet system, so he's got a totally unique thing. So it's just like and he it, came right to Finley, then, right? So I remember he started out like he was like staying with Kenny Ramsey, and then eventually the Jeffire guy at Finley was like, "Hey, man, this guy, he's got a unique situation," and he had very little English, and then he went to Finley, and he was a one fifty pounder, and he won the NAI at one sixty seven. Yeah. Did they bump him up and wrestle? Who did he wrestle? It was either Anthony Gary or Juggy Franklin, and he beat him. And those dudes were seven. They were were massive seventy-seven pounders. (laughs) I'm sure. And the the last time I heard this was Sean Nelson talking about it, and he can tell a story too. So like, I I can't remember the details. I love Sean Nelson because I think he was there at the time. He's still the head coach at Finley. He's he's the nut, but he's the man. Yes, correct. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they got that guy in there. But we're we're talking about guys who are really exceptional, right? Like, so yeah. let me think about this. You've got kids that you're coaching now whose parents didn't wrestle. Yeah. We all have that, right? I mean, I see people all the time. I'm like, hey, you got to get your kid. Like, there's kids on Ford's football team this year, seven, seven, eight year old football. They got a really good kid. He's a defensive lineman, just crushing everybody a lot of aggression. I was like, gotta get your kid out for wrestling. Yeah, it's going to be really good at wrestling. He's a big, he's aggressive. And um, they went out for wrestling and they're having a great time. My kids, my kids over here playing basketball, their kids out there, you know, wrestling and learning the sport. And um doesn't seem to bug my kids. <laughs> no, and, and then there's a hurdle to, yeah, we always are going to have a hurdle, not being like the popular sport, but I think we also kind of thrive on that of like, we don't, you know, there's part of us that appreciates that not everybody can do this, but, I think 
we'll gain, you know, that's what we have to do. We have to get more kids that are not raised in the sport to do it. And then also is that we can't lose people that, you know, are big in the sport. We can't lose their kids. Yeah, that's that, that I would agree with that statement. Uh, I think Lincoln McElravey's kids played basketball. I think that's mm-hmm. actually, I they definitely did. I know that because he built like a gym mm-hmm. for them and they had their own, their own gym and like a barn. Uh, D2 wrestling, you know, obviously I'm, I'm really getting into D2 wrestling with my nephew transferring to Grand Valley. Um, your guys' Midlands is coming up. Um, yeah, the Midwest Classic. Midwest Classic. Talk about the Midwest Classic a little bit. And did you guys at Mercyhurst go to the Midwest Classic? So I never wrestled there. <laughs> As, um, a coach. I, As a coach. I coached, I coached there. My first year at Coker was the first year Mercyhurst went as well. So they've been going for like six or seven years. Essentially, the Midwest Classic probably has 51 teams, I think, this year. And there's 76 teams in Division Two. So uh, the lion's share of them. And most of the heavy hitters are there. So, for example, I know at 165 this year, uh, one of our higher-ranked kids is Dylan Walker. Dylan Walker will have the one and two-ranked kids in his bracket. And Dylan's either three or four. So, you know, like, essentially, if – you know, which we never, like, if if the tournament proceeds the right way, like, he's going to get an experience of, okay, this is what nationals can look like. And it's a two-day tournament in Indianapolis held at UND, and uh, it's a it's a grind. Like, I think what it can do is it can set you up, because Division Two is now seeded. So if you win your region, like, there you can seed it. So it can set you up to have a seed at the national tournament and make your path hopefully a little more manageable than it than it would be if you're just drawn in but also it can tell you okay i'm not where i need to be i got to find a way to get there and we've had that experience i had that experience with mercier's kids of a couple kids going there and like being like oh boy this is another step up and then they you know found their groove second semester into an all-american finish that year but it's a it's a real test in the middle of the year we always talked about we'd like to peak a couple times throughout the year because you can't just continue to peak, right? There has to be like ebbs and flows to training to cycle. Wrestling. Training cycle. Training cycle. So for us, it was always we want to peak at Midwest in the first semester, be ready to go in the second semester at the national duels. And then for us at Mercyhurst, it was always Gannon and UPJ were the end of the year. We want to be really revving up for that and then peak in at regionals and and uh in the national tournament. So the Midwest is that first part of the year where you're like, okay, the first, you know, the grind of like, we've been going in September, October, November, December, it starts getting long, but like that's the light at the end of the tunnel for the first semester where you're like, okay, now like the show's here. My problem is that now the D ones have eliminated wanting to, or wrestling the D twos all together for the most part, well, unless it's Kent state, right? Yeah. Everybody else it has essentially eliminated it because it can only hurt them. Right. That's what I was going to say. Why would you do it for that? Correct. Like, Here's like, the other like, thing. Why so would you? It doesn't figure into your RPI and your, your winning percentage. And it looks bad. It's bad. If it's it looks, essentially it bad, if you're it's a D one guy. It is bad to wrestle a D two guy. And then on top of it, if you lose, right? Like, Oh, I lost to a D two guy. Right there. That, you know, that's the mentality. Right. And, it can only be detrimental with winning percentage RPI, which none of that matters in D2. D2 comes down to one day at the regional. Talk about how important the one day regional is, super regional, sorry. Yeah. And qualifying an NCAA D2. They changed it, right? It went from four to three, didn't it? So there used to be four regions of four, and now there's six regions of three. Um. Uh, that will, and by that, I mean four qualify out of four and three qualify out of six now. So there's 18 qualifiers, three qualify out of it. The Super Region 1 that we were in was was the PSAC, essentially, and then another couple teams. But the I think the thing I really like about the Division 2 model is you got to show up for regionals and you got to qualify your spot. There's not like a wild card to get in. Like you got to show up on this day to be ready. And then two weeks later, you got to show up on this day to win a national title. So you have an off day, you get dinged up, you get hurt. There's an argument to be made that like the division one model makes sure it's the highest quality tournament possible because you get the 
you know, kids that have a bad weekend, but have had a great year still get in. And I appreciate that. But there's something I really like about you could be the best kid in the country and you have two bad matches at the regionals and you're not at the national tournament. There's something that to me that, that gives the idea of like this high end competitiveness of like, you got to show up and like, you can't make mistakes. There's something that I enjoy about that, but I understand the division one model of wanting to like put the best product out there on some level too. Well, it's like, there's been years where dudes just have weighed in because all you got to do is weigh in at the, at the conference tournament. Um, and then you get the bid that you brought to the conference, right? Or and that on. can't happen hold at Division Two. You don't. The committee will pick you. Yes. You don't get the bid. Someone steals your bid, essentially. But you're and, still and they should do that because they're allowed to. Like, if my knees dinged up and I'm like, two more weeks is going to do wonders for me. Like, they should because like they're playing the game the right way. But if you eliminated that ability, then there's you know you're gonna have to go out there and figure it out. Yeah. Uh, Ian Miller got per concussion protocol that the 2016 Mac and they were like, you're done. Mm -hmm. they, they were like, you're done. They would not let him finish the match. He was in, he was going for his fourth Mac title. And they're like, yep, you're done down to fourth one or down to sixth. You're done. So in the D two model, Ian Miller doesn't wrestle. i in the greatest, the best match in Madison square garden in 2016, the match at the high school, which, the match which I get that. Like, like you lose stuff like that, which is yeah. devastating. I get that, but like, there's something maybe, maybe I, maybe I'm an agent of chaos and I enjoy a little bit of chaos, right? So I enjoy the chaos of like, the one seed might not be there, you know, like I don't. It say it works the same way in high school, doesn't it? Like sexual yeah. district, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Sectional district state, you guys show, yeah, yeah, oh yeah. I, mm -hmm. I agree with you. Um, mm -hmm. what does so D two is right about? To pass D1 with the amount of teams. I believe, is, is it even right now at 76? I think we have 76 last I remember, but it, it's, it, there's, there. But you're, you're going to pass, you're going to, they're adding every year. The division yeah. has exploded since you were in college to now. Was there 30, 30 more teams, 20, 25, 30 more teams? Yeah, at least that. And I, I think, I mean, I went to the NWCA conference a couple of times and, just looking and, and hearing people talk, it's, I mean, that's all on Mike Moyer. Like, I think he has brought wrestling out of the depths of the, you know, late 80s, early 90s, even mid 90s of when wrestling was at its lowest. And and I, I don't think it was feasible. We weren't just going to add Division One programs. So, you know, I know him and Whaler talk a bit and, and like, he's always looking, okay, who's the next guy that we got to plug in here? Who's the coach that's going to make this a successful program? And they do some really cool things at the NWCA. They do like a leadership academy. I did one year. And it is what you were saying earlier. They literally tell you, you are the CEO of your program. So you have to know wrestling, but that's not a big part of it. You have to be able to recruit. You have to be able to manage schedules. You have to be able to fundraise. You have to, you know, all these things, work with your administrators. And so D2 is growing exponentially, you know, not exponentially, but it's consistently growing every year. And, uh, it's just giving kids more opportunities to wrestle in college. I think the more opportunities they have to wrestle in college, the more that kids will continue to wrestle longer, you know, because a lot of kids will wrestle for a couple of years and then get out. But if every community has a, you know, a Lake Erie or a Grand Valley or a Cleveland State or, you know, like every community has a college that they know they can go wrestle to. And that college is in their community growing the sport. Wrestling grows with that. So you, so, you know, speaking of growth, you know, women's wrestling is on a huge upswing, especially OAC. You added the women's division, I want to say five years ago. That sounds right. Yeah. Five years. I mean, you, my time. You, yeah, it was before you, but then, you know, you now have NAIA, D2, <laughs> D1 teams are adding the sport of wrestling. Um, the JUCOs are adding it. Uh, all levels of college wrestling are adding, you know, women's. Uh, state associations, PIAA has added it, OHSA added it. I think most of the of the state associations that have a boys' state championship now have a girls. What do you see for the future of women's and girls wrestling moving forward in the growth there? I think, I mean, as of right now, it seems like it's growing at an extremely healthy pace and should continue to grow. Um, 
to the naysayers, I think, uh, I mean, you grew up hearing people say, wrestling teaches you this, wrestling teaches you that, you know, wrestling can, you know, make you a better person. And why wouldn't we want that for everybody? Like, that's what I don't understand. It's like, yeah, I want, I want young women to grow into, you know, responsible young women the same way I want young men to grow into responsible young men. And, you know, wrestling can teach you a lot. And in terms of accountability, you know, discipline, focus, toughness, all that. And I think our world would be a way better place if men and women had a bit more of those qualities. Um, I think women's wrestling is being championed very well by a lot of people. Um, I think it, it, it's it's growing in a really cool way. Um, there's a lot of pride behind it, which I really like. You know, like I think they're a very loud voice, which, you know, is really cool to hear that. And like the growth is like these girls are getting better and better. I think if you watch in the inception of women in the Olympics, when was that? 2000? 2000? Yeah, 2004, I think. 2000, right around that era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Hold on, like, I'm going to check down because I, I really want to get this one right. And don't get me wrong, they were they were really good then. But the growth of women's wrestling, like they're they they're moving at such a rate of like skill and competitiveness that the sport is becoming a really fun thing to watch. It's always been fun to watch, but it's becoming more fun to watch with the high level of you know. Sometimes it seems like some of these girls throw the kitchen sink a little more than guys do too. Yes, like there's a lot of that chucking chucking people and like, locks, high crazy flying big guy flyers yeah uh 2004 was their first mm-hmm. year in the uh the olympics 04 in athens but yeah i mean i just think it's going to continue to to grow and explode at all levels at all the youth the middle school the high school and then on to the college and obviously international um Man, you, what else you got for me? I don't even know. Uh, you know, I'm in a little bit of a, uh, you know, my wife's watching volleyball right now uh, in the living room. But uh, what do you got for me? Anything else good? Not a ton. I'm just, I'm excited for this year to go. I think uh, it's been really fun. The OAC is a really cool organization. Um, Jared and Jude are awesome people. I got a, I got a cool story about Jude. And this is this is part of the reason I think this is, this is a big moment for me. So I talked about, I wrestled Jared's youngest brother, a bunch. His brother was going for a fourth SBC title. I'd never beaten Troy and Troy is Jude's nephew. And uh, when Troy, I beat Troy at SBCs, it probably wasn't better than him, but but it was a big deal. And uh, this is something about like the character where this play started within 10 minutes. Ed Upfer, Jared's dad, and Jude had like approached me and were like, hey man, super proud of you. Congratulations. After, you know, Troy was about to do something really big, you know, four SBC titles. And like the character of like Jude and Ed and these St. Mary's people, that was like a big watershed moment for me because they were the enemy for so long. And I was like, oh my gosh, like these are such decent, good people. And that's only been proven a hundred times over this past year, working with Jared and working with Jude, who are just there. It's fun to go to work. It's funny. Jared and I were talking the other day and um, we're talking about like winning the lottery or something like that. And like, I was like, Jared, I think if I win the lottery, I'm going to keep doing the same thing I'm doing. <laughs> like I'll still work at the OAC. I'll still coach St. Mary's wrestling. Like I'll still like, it won't change. Like I'm doing my dream job. You know, I'm not going to be a, multi-millionaire doing this job but this is like this is fun i'm in wrestling um everything's different i'm on my feet moving around a lot i'm doing it with people i really like and it's a really cool organization that you know uh i think i i think is is a really great beacon for wrestling in ohio that's a fabulous way to beacon for wrestling in ohio i think that that's you know i've been working with them since 08 man and Obviously, been dealing with them since early '90s, right? With, with uh, junior high wrestling against them, and and just dealing. They're just just fabulous people, man. I I could tell you twenty stories of like what you just told me about the operas, and yeah, it wouldn't. Sh- none of it would shock you. Um, yeah, I owe a lot to them. They're fabulous people, but um, well, dude, I'm 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 pretty uh, 
I'm good here. I'm gonna go feed the fire. Yeah. Drink a little more water, hang out, and uh, get ready for some basketball and grade school state duels, huh? Super pumped about it, dude. Gonna film both of them. Uh, should be a grand old time, and uh, we'll get some stuff figured out. Um, we've got December fifteenth. Yeah, hold on. Let me make sure. Let me make sure. Sorry, December sixteenth. And 17th, December 16th, OAC, Grade School State Duels. Are we streaming? We are not streaming, but we're recording. Okay. And then Defense Soap, December 17th, right? Yep. Defense Soap Duels. It's on the National Duels, Club Duels, and then OAC, Grade School State Duels. It should be a lot of awesome wrestling. See what the best, you know, K through six kids look like in Ohio. And then the next day, see some of the best youth wrestling from K through eight in the country love it all right coach mm-hmm. michael baxter thank you for the time stick around will do